question. I'm just going to start with the premise of under the hood, which is there's a concept that we work with that is a truth that patterns that are created in childhood impact us as grown-ups. Hmm. And taking this on to interview leaders, people that have had their own lives, their own stories, their own ups and downs, we hope to inspire not only leaders who are already kind of in certain positions, but also the young people. We were just talking about respect and some of the old values <laughs> that this crew really, really values. And with that, Hal, welcome. Hal, and I'm going to read a little bit about your bio okay. and let good folks know a little bit about Hal Brody. He does have a unique and a diverse background, directing a number of businesses in various industries, ranging from services to retail, to publishing, to real estate. He started purchased, built and sold businesses that became nationally and recognized as leaders in their market sector. He has a personal purpose to enhance the lives of thousands of human beings, to help leaders empower themselves and their teams to achieve extraordinary growth and discover their high purpose while being surrounded by close relationships. As a group chair of Vistage International, Hal leads peer groups comprised of CEO and C-level executives. As a highly experienced entrepreneur, he has also acted as a personal advisor to leaders of non-Vistage businesses ranging in size from startup to over $100 million in, national, in annual revenue. So welcome, Hal. Thank you so much to Under the Hood. Thank you. And we're getting close to our first anniversary. Well, thank you, uh, Tina. And uh, I was cringing a little at, uh, at, at my bio. I'm sure I wrote that a few years ago. <laughs> Extraordinary growth doesn't feel right anymore for me for some reason. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably need to reword that a little bit. I like growth, uh, but it can be enough you know so anyway all right well we're, we're going to get to that because you're at a certain point in your life where maybe it feels like i've done a lot of work already and maybe there's not quite as much to do um but perhaps there may be so let me ask you the first question tell us a little bit about your family of origin if you would just things that would be important you think for us to know sure i uh I grew up in the Midwest in uh, St. Louis um, uh, in the 50s. Uh, dad was a salt of the earth uh, type of guy, worked at the post office uh, for 40 years and retired very comfortably from that. Um, mom was a challenge. Mom was uh, schizophrenic. So uh, I guess that kind of the to your suggestion as to what we uh, what we got out of our childhood, the, the blessing of that is that I had to question everything. I uh, never knew it was real. There were lots of delusions that uh, were brought into my life at an early stage. And, uh, so, but that turned out to be a very positive thing for me. So, you know, one, one of the other guests that we had, had talked about uh, issues that, you know, I can't remember which parent, but one of the things that he learned from that was to be a great observer. And so I think that's kind of what you're describing in a way mm -hmm. and trying to figure out and be curious. How, just tell us a little bit more about that, how that kind of showed up in your life as you, as you grew up. Well, I guess like, a, like you were saying, it's uh, being curious, uh, always interested in, in hearing the other side, although, uh, you know, always being skeptical of, of both sides, to be quite honest. Um, uh, but I guess I think ultimately it was about finding my own path. Uh, making, you know, trying not to necessarily take too much direction from the home life, uh, if I could, and, and, and try to find out what, what I wanted. And, listen to my own heart, listen to my own biorhythms. And... So at, at a young age, that's not easy to do. No. Now, when did you start to kind of think that I need to, I need to listen to me, which <laughs> <laughs> is something that we yeah. all kind of work at as adults. I do yeah. I need to 
listen to me. Well, you know, like most uh, kids and teenagers, especially, I did a lot of stupid things uh, and uh, was lucky enough to avoid any kind of deep trouble from it. Um, I uh, got a lot of platitudes from both parents about what was right and what was wrong. Uh, I think probably the, mo the, the most interesting one is that my mom said, you could go to college. I want you to go to college. Of course, everybody in our family goes to college uh, in my generation. Neither of my parents did. Uh, but uh, take anything you want except business, because that's a waste of your time. <laughs> so naturally, I got an MBA. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And it just felt right. I mean, it, you know, somewhere in college, it... it it seemed to be where you know, I, I was. I changed majors every semester, pretty much for the first three years, and and then the the dean of uh, the liberal arts told me about this special three plus two program that I could get into and get my MBA in five years. Uh, all I had to do was get straight A's as a junior, and I got all A's and a B in his class, but I got in anyway. So, <laughs> so again, I could appreciate how much you had to kind of really develop on your own. And, you know, I, I was listening yesterday to something about by the time we're seven, we have these programs that are already programmed within us. And a good part of the rest of our lives is deprogramming those programs. And not having that level of guidance, you really, really had to depend on yourself. And I just kind of have a sense that your intelligence also helped your ability to nail, you know, nail down those A's when you needed to and go after something that you really wanted. Well, I, it took a lot of work, I think, to get to decide what parts of me I can trust to, even myself, uh, where I, you know, what what messages I should be listening to that made sense. So, um, you know, I, I, I can look- How did you do that, Hal? How did you go about it? What were some of the things that, you know, kind of methods, teachers, anybody that sort of helped you along the way? Uh, well, <laughs> I can tell, let's say there's one story uh, after I got my MBA, actually, I went to work uh, for a conglomerate. This is 1970. 74 and uh it was actually my my dad's cousin was the ceo of chromaloy american corporation uh he had put together uh this was the 70s when conglomerates were hot and he was they were trading his massively overpriced stock for small to medium companies between five and 50 million in sales and they had gotten real close to a billion dollars and they were just putting their own team together and i was one of the two junior accountants brought in in the internal audit department and um went through my first year learned a lot uh matter of fact probably a lot of what i do today i uh i went from company to company our job back in those days was to to go to each company and try to get the money back to corporate faster so go through their books and you know collect the receivables faster, pay the payables slower, lower our inventory, all these usual things that you have to do uh, so that, you know, we can get the money back to corporate so they could get their loans down. Anyway, uh, but because of that, that's kind of what I do now as I go into different, I don't know, I'm, as a Vistage chair, I, I get to meet a lot of different uh, CEOs, business owners who are trying to make their best decisions. So that was a kind of a good setup. Um, but back to your question about the mentoring. So what happened is after the, I was there for a year and my review comes up and my boss uh, says, hey, uh, we want to give you a little bit of raise and a little more responsibility. And I, I'm still, my prefrontal lobe still haven't developed fully. I'm 23 and I'm like, you know, thanks. I, I think I might want to do something different here. I see lots of opportunities. Let me go ta talk to uh, my dad's cousin, the CEO, and because I got some ideas. So uh, my boss, Brad, the internal audit manager, goes to his boss, uh, George, the, the controller. George goes to Frank, uh, the CFO, and Frank says, fire the asshole. And so I was out. Uh, but so, so but three weeks later, I, I had already 
started my own business with some friends during college. We were in the music business and I had a record store. I went back. I, I wanted to say thanks to my dad's cousin, Joe, and tell him what happened. And, and I he was kind enough, brings me up to his office and says, uh, old Jewish guy, Harold, Harold, uh, you know, over the years, I've developed some sechel. That's uh, Yiddish for wisdom. <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you that, you know, I was happier when I was running my dry cleaning business. I got I got all these stockholders. I got all these, I got, uh, you know, all kinds of stakeholders that are, you know, I got pre vice presidents, all these companies, all, all on my case to do things. I got Frank in the other office who fired you. Harold, blood is thicker than water. If you want to work here, you can't work here, but I'll put you in in, in Europe or in, in California or something. I'll find something for you. But if I were you, I'd stay with my own thing. You got that rec that music business? Stick with that. Be in charge of your own life. So that was a very big. That was a big step. Yeah. A big step. Big mentor. A big. Yeah. I'll never forget the conversation. So tell us a little bit about the music business and then how did you kind of move through that? Because that also, that business is very volatile. I know that business really well. Yeah, well, we were in the 70s. Uh, we were kind of in the right spot at the right time. We didn't know what we were doing. There were four of us uh, who were basically just not trying not to spend too much time in school. So we, a friend of a friend had a record store in Lawrence, Kansas. He was shutting it down. He put it all in a U-Haul truck and drove it down. And all of a sudden we're in the record business. We don't know what we're doing and we do everything wrong for quite a while, but we were in a good location. We started to figure it out. We started and it, it started to do well. And by, so that was 71 when we opened 75, we're doing pretty well. I got into an argument with uh, my partners uh, over a pittance of money, um, $2,500 total. Uh, and you know, I, I said, well, I don't want to work with you if, I, if that if that's the way it's going to be. So I uh, I decided to take we had we had a, a division where we also sold uh, wholesale for small labels. I said, let me take the, the the smaller part of the company and I'll switch and I'll move. And they couldn't understand why I would be willing to do that because the money was being made in the retail side. Anyway, I did um, went off, did my own thing. 14 years later, the $2,500, now I'm going through a divorce in 1989 at 39 years old, and I needed a break. And my old partner, who had done well, had built his up to 20, 25 stores. I had done well. I was up to like uh, 15 or 18 stores. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to buy me out, and I uh, got him to overpay. So the $2,500 turned into about $4 million. <laughs> Uh, and he was happy to pay it. So let me ask you this, okay? Given these stories, if there were one or two qualities that actually got you where you to that fabulous place, what were those? And then what were the one or two qualities that just keep kept, you know, that you just couldn't get beyond or hadn't gotten beyond that kept kind of knocking you in the head? Well, I'll start with the second one there. Uh, going back to childhood, one of the things that my dad uh, pushed on me, my only parent that had one foot in reality, when my mom was my mom was demanding divorce and he would go, Harold, work on your mom tonight. And I, of course, I was 13 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, my only tool in the toolbox was a hammer. I would scream at her for a few minutes every evening and then allow myself to get exhausted and fall into bed. I spent, I made many mistakes, uh, and I'm now on my fourth wife. Well, I'm proud to say I've, uh, I'm happily buried to, but the first three were all kind of that same pattern. I was trying to find a woman who needed fixing, and uh, guess what? I failed every time. So that's, that's the stumbling block. It took me into my 60s to kind of find the, the right woman. <laughs> um not, not only the right woman, but um, the right understanding. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the understanding that it not nothing is going to be idyllic and loving, and and you know people are going to always be people, and there'll always be faults. But all it, it's not that complicated either. It's about loving somebody else, and starts by loving yourself. No. So again, just going back to that impact from childhood, 
how many things kind of happen on, out of our awareness. And we just make decisions thinking that's the best possible thing to do. You know? and, um, and many times in our lives, in our adult lives, we have to just keep looking at where we keep knocking our heads against the wall. And at some point, Hopefully, thanks to a lot of therapy, thanks to um, a few experiences with some hallucinogenic drugs, I've uh, learned quite a bit. Yes, still and much they are now more. Coming back in, they are now coming back into um, into you know into favor under under well, some certain circumstances. Yeah, yeah, they're being used uh, to help a lot of people. Uh, you know. Uh, MDMA is 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 becoming a you know probably get legalized here soon. They're using it with PTSD and uh, psilocybin is being used for folks that are uh, terminal. It seems to change their world a lot. The fear goes away. So a lot of good things are happening. It's unfortunate that it you know the, I think probably the pharmaceutical companies got overly concerned about it back in the the seventies and made some. Uh, claims that probably weren't completely true. Things keep coming around. Things keep coming around. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You know, for every person who's been a success, there are certain lessons that we learn from some of what we call your failures. I don't only call them failures if we don't learn from them. In turn, you gave us a little bit of story with your business stuff. What was your sort of look? Again, you gave us the one on the money that you made. Do you have another one where something that looked like a failure turned out to be a reward? Always, By everything. Yeah, well, I'm at this stage. I'm definitely convinced that everything there's a, there's going to be a reward in everything. Um, the one that immediately pops into my head after I sold my newspaper in the Midwest, uh, I had of kind of a big head. Now I'd had a couple of successes with the music business and the newspaper did well. I was sure I could do well at anything. Um, actually, I did. I think I had the formula down, except for the part where I I, uh, I really relied on other people. That's part of the formula, obviously. Hiring really smart people that are better than me at, at what they do and getting out of their way. I got into the tea business, which was a fascinating business. I, you know, I, I, uh, I was working some real estate and some guy comes in and starts telling me about his bubble tea, he wants to open a bubble tea shop. And I, I did some research on that. And then I, I got curious about the whole tea industry and how big it is and how much bigger it is than coffee. So I ended up opening a, a tea shop in, in Kansas City with, um, uh, that did both traditional teas and the bubble teas. And it actually did pretty well. My mistake was, I mean, maybe hospitality might not be my best industry. I don't think it was the industry. The, what the failure was, I uh, relied on other people and I wasn't watching them. So I, I hired a manager. I wanted her to be a partner. Hey, we can turn this thing into 20 stores. Let's get going. And without paying too much attention, I turned around couple of years later, continuing to feed it money because it was losing money uh, and found out that she had been stealing from me for quite a while. Stuff was going out the back door. Um, so the lesson was pay attention. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, you definitely will. You, you need other people to be successful. And my, all my successes have been about other people and all of my failures. Uh, you know, the, the ones that I the failures I could have caught earlier, and I can think of a couple others. It was about trust, a little too trusting even. So I, I love I love these themes. So you had a formula that mm -hmm. you used over and over and over again that led to your success in, in the most part, right? And also some things that you needed to keep an eye on that you needed to keep learning. So in terms of business and in terms of people watching, you know, everybody's sort of like, how do you do this? How do you do this? How did you do that? How did you do that? I'm, we're always, I'm always interested in how people have succeeded and the, the way that they think. Right? So you saw, yeah, right? You, you saw that. I don't, I'm a, I'm a go with the flow kind of guy. And I'm, you know, I think the, uh, the thing that I, uh, I, I set my priorities. Business always made sense. It wasn't that complicated in my mind anyway. So 
Um, the thing that occurs to me is that the reason I, I learned that I had to get out of the way, because I had to get out of the way. I went through a divorce with four kids under five years old. Uh, I thought everything was peachy keen. And for whatever reason, that that wife just saw me as evil. And I was in a horrible custody battle for a year and a half, feeling like I lost. And I had I had uh, two businesses, three businesses going, and I basically wasn't couldn't pay attention. And because luck also pays a huge plays a huge part in it, at that point, I had really, really good people in places that I that need I needed them. And all I was really only caring at that stage, I was the only thing I cared about was the kids. But sure enough, I'd go in for my weekly meeting on Friday mornings and I'd get caught up and things pretty much went as good as could be expected during that period. So so life is complicated, could we say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, I, we have a couple more minutes. I'm going to ask you one last question, and then I'm going to open it up for anybody else that may want to ask you a question. Um, what were some of the sacrifices that you had to make for your success? Hmm. Sacrifices that I had to make. You know, I don't know if I call them sacrifices because, again, going back to the earlier question, everything has a an upside. Uh, it might feel like a setback or it might feel like I have to give something up. Um, yeah, giving up working <laughs> long hours in a business, I had to give that up so because I wanted to be home with the kids. Uh, uh, just a trade-off. So. so being able to see that practicality of that there is a silver lining, depending on the way that you tweak it and the way that you look at it which is an incredibly yeah. important message. I used to say to yeah. the, the mother of all four of my kids, everything's going to be fine as long as we let it. Don't don't get too upset. And apparently, she didn't listen to that, <laughs> that philosophy of mine. So, Very cool. So I'm just going to open it up. Does anybody have any questions for Hal and his varied life and interesting operations and Loves and lost and. Hey, so, Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Hal, so I, I, so I, I, I have a few questions. The first one I have in my head is, so with all your experiences and all your ups and downs, uh, and I'm, I'm familiar with Vistage because I have some very good friends who are Vistage coaches as well. How have you applied? your learnings and your experiences with the people that you, that you coach and um, with, without basically, uh, without basically, well, just guiding them versus, uh, versus forcing them to change, I guess would be the, because sometimes you, you know, look, we all see this, they're like, oh my God, this guy's doing it all fucking wrong. Excuse me. Yep. <laughs> it's a technical <laughs> term <laughs> and but but you you can't you can't you can't say that right you can't yeah you well and, I, and, no. and you seem like a very straight straightforward guy so <laughs> well so he might <laughs> um to your point like most things ever that i that it, we all do we do it wrong at first and right. i learned that that's you can't help people by telling them what to do, and it and that really is the in my, what I've gotten out of this last ten years of, of being a business chair is that coaching is about helping them come up with their own answers. It's not about you telling them what to do. It's hard when you have a whole you know oh, I got fifty years I can tell you what I did when I and you share it of of course, but you, you really have to be careful. Um, that you're not trying to push people in, a, in any direction, that let them come up with their own answers as much as possible, because none of us know exactly what's going on in that other person's soul and in his heart. And we think we do. And, and to me, that the beauty of what I get to do now is that I get to have intimate relationships with people. I get to know them on such a personal level. Uh, I see Dave Kahane is here. He's not in, he was in my group temporarily for a while when we were uh, uh, combining groups. And I mean, you know, those those few periods, one-to-one uh, -one time that we spent together were like 
incredibly re rewarding for me. And that's Great. Hey, Dave. Hi there. How you doing, Can't buddy? On today. I'm great. I thought I would just listen in. I I know we had a just, we had a wonderful breakfast, so I got most of that uh, bio from uh, from our breakfast. And uh, <laughs> I think the gentleman's question, Adriano's question, is a good one. How do you how do you uh, comprehend all that you've learned, and how do you guide people to those conclusions without uh, directing them? And I think Dave is a great example. He's doing it for his own team at this stage. He's got an, an uh, unworldly abil or level of experience, and yet he's 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 teaching, he's, he's coaching, he's leveling up up his people constantly. So good yeah. to hear from you. Dave. The best, yeah, the go, best. Ahead. go ahead, Dave. Oh no, no, I just said thank you, Al. It's good to see you. So, what one of my teachers said to me, he said the best compliment that you could ever get is when they don't even mention your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I came up this all on my own. <laughs> or this was my idea. And, yeah, it's true. Uh, it, it's a beautiful profession, coaching and watching people flourish and and grow. And so, thank you, Hal. Yeah, yeah that gets <laughs> back to my. I don't know about extraordinary growth. I think uh, I think growth is good. Uh, I'm a little worried about where we are as a world right now that we can't keep. You know, unlimited growth is not the answer. So, well, personal growth could never hurt anybody. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's personal stuff. Sure. Right. The personal stuff is the kind of what we're talking about that then leads to this other, all the other possibilities in life. Mm -hmm. And again, I I do the show under the hood because I I get we're getting under the hood of how people tick and, and the kinds of influences that they've had. And some people go down the tubes with it and other people just keep coming back, just keep coming back and, and how you just keep kept coming back and still do. And I would encourage people to get on Hal's mailing list, get his newsletter because it's juicy. There's a lot of really great articles in there. And one of the reasons I invited him is because I love the way he thinks. <laughs> and so I encourage you. encourage that and how please um we will actually you can put your your contact information in the chat if you would and then Sheila will be happy to share it with other people sure so well thank and you thank again. you Tina uh we loved having you at the group we want to get you back again so it was a very well received uh talk so thank you for inviting me my pleasure so this is Mastery Under Pressure, who is really kind of bringing you under the hood, under the hood of all those things that go on under this part of the brain so that you have become actually masterful at your own life. So thank you again. And next month we have Steve Lashansky, who is a wonderful leadership coach with another great story. So that will be in June. And we have a whole list of fabulous people all the way up through the rest of the year. So thank you again, and we'll see you next time.